Good afternoon. My name is Dustin Dupas, Chief Operating Officer at Tabs Analytics. Welcome to our March Analytics Series webinar, Six Things You Need to Know from Loyalty Data. If you've ever dived into retail or loyalty data, then you know how important and challenging it can be if you do it correctly. We'll present our way of looking at loyalty data in today's webinar. Today's presentation will be our first webinar of the 2018 series, and our next webinar will be the third annual baby care study covering trends in five major baby care segments. Be sure to check, uh, join us for that presentation on Wednesday, April 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can check back at our website at tabsanalytics.com later this week for that sign up information. Presenting today is Dr. Kurt Jetta, CEO and founder of Tabs Analytics. And at the end of the presentation, we're gonna open the floor to questions and that you can submit on the question box on the GoToWebinar screen. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jetta. Thank you, Dustin, and thank you for all of you that uh, carved out some time in your day to attend this webinar. Just for those of you, we do record all these, but for those of you that um, are only listening to the recording, uh, you we stop it after the presentation, and you are the big denied stamp on the Q&A part, which uh, there's usually a lot of good questions. So I would encourage you, if you have the time, sit in, ask the questions, fire away. Of course, I'm always uh, available for questions for everyone uh, afterwards uh, at Kurt, K-U-R-T, Jetta, J-E-T-T-A, at tabsanalytics.com. I also, before I get started, want to thank my associate, Adam Hill. He's our resident expert on loyalty card analytics. Um, the only reason he's not presenting, and I am, is I've got the shtick. And the shtick is everything in this type of uh, this type of uh, medium when you're doing webinars. So uh, let's get to it. So the, the six things I want to review today are. First of all, just a review of what are the strengths and the weaknesses of loyalty data. And I should really reframe it as rewards programs, uh, shopper card data, maybe even better. Uh, we'll talk about a way to analyze promotions differently than you have in the past. Um, two ways to uh, regard your uh, target audience and how you might want to do it differently in the future. The bread and butter of all consumer uh, panel data, whether it be uh, shopper data or uh, syndicated data from services like IRI or Nielsen, is uh, purchase dynamics. And then finally, we'll get into one um, application that is particularly relevant for this type of data, and that's trial and repeat, really, to gauge new products. So let's start, first of all, talking about the strengths and the weaknesses, because this is a data source that is very widely used, and I just hear way more frustrations with it than I do, you know, people saying, hey, this is great, I use it all the time, um, and we help it, it builds our business. Certainly those stories exist, but... More often than not, I hear, you know, which is somewhat legitimate, it's just a big shakedown for um, retailers to get money out of manufacturers. And so it's really important to understand what are the strengths of this data and then what are the shortcomings that we need to work around and make sure we don't get into the traps of bad analytics. So let's start with the strengths. And by far the biggest strength of this shopper data is its granularity because there are tens of thousands and in some cases millions of sample uh, p panelists, you get an extraordinarily robust database and you can get very granular because of the high sample sizes on the periods you review. So you can do weekly, whereas in syndicated data, you're looking at quarterly or annually to make sure you have, you have statistical validity, or you can get granular on the item. Uh, whereas you know, usually you're j just constrained to just brand or segment type of views using syndicated panel. So I can't stress enough the importance of granularity uh, with respect to this, and it's one of the major benefits of shopper data. Also, this is a source that almost always correlates with actual sales that would be read through the scanner. So there's a topic we uh, 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 word we 
call coverage factor, meaning what percent of actual sales are covered through the panel or the research method. And in syndicated sources, and when I say I'll use syndicated uh, and talk Nielsen and syndicated interchangeably, but syndicated is IRI, Nielsen, uh, and there's one called InfoScout. So those are all can be used interchangeably. But often you'll get times where you'll know from looking at scanner data where sales are up um, and the panel shows it down and then almost consistently there's a lack of coverage meaning it's not you know only capturing 40 to 60 percent of the actual sales going through the register you don't you rarely have that issue with loyalty data because it's covering more than 80 percent and often 90 to 95 percent. Now not everybody that shops at these uh, retailers that offer rewards programs uses their card but a very very high percentage of them do. And so because of that you get great uh, you know, ability to kind of really with a high degree of statistical reliability uh, find the causation of sales. And then also, and find the third one is just it's always it's on demand access. So whenever you need to get in and get reports, and it's either if it's not real time, it's updated weekly. They, there's some degree of variation among the retailers' uh, rewards programs, but it, you have very current, reliable, reliable data. But it's also very important to understand some significant weaknesses. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, we have shopper data. We don't really need the Nielsen panel data. And that is absolutely false. That is because one of the big things is that when you only have shopper data, you lack the visibility to what's going on in the outside world. So only the very uh, Walmart really is the only retailer where we see instances that they're capturing 50% or more of their shoppers uh, purchases within a uh, given category. Even the large successful retailers like a Kroger, for example, or Target, they're capturing well under 50% of their sales. So there's a lot of business. In fact, the majority of business occurs outside of there, and that's something that they should want to know about and in fact they do want to know about that so the two really need to be used in combination they both have their strengths and weaknesses I already talked about the strengths of shopper data you're also usually at the mercy of the retailer in how you can structure your architecture the ones that do allow some customization it tends to be very cumbersome not real flexible um, and so you're not only at the mercy of their product architecture but also and we'll review this in a little bit some of the questionable buyer segmentation are those segments structured that really add value to understanding consumer behavior one thing you see and particularly in HBC but we also see it in food on a brand level is there really is minimal repeat activity because as I just mentioned in the first point, because shoppers bounce around from outlet to outlet so much that it actually you don't get a whole lot of multiple purchasing. Um, and so that somewhat under, you know, undermines the whole notion of loyalty marketing. Now, that's not to say there's not value into the data, but you just need to be realistic about these things on how much repeat and loyalty really can you capture when the vast majority of purchasing is really only one-time purchasing of a given brand, much less a given item. Um, and that's at a, at a consumer level, that is. And then overall, and this has to do, I think, a lot of with, you know, people identifying, you know, how to really analyze this and utilize it in the best manner it's not in general the this whole data source is not delivering results and we see a lot of retailers that are underperforming the market and they have a tremendous amount of shopper data and they you know, heavily utilize uh, the programs that they they have the ability to execute with this so one of the components, now there's two big ones, one I'll talk about in a little bit, but the other one is I just don't think there is an industry-wide consensus on how best to leverage the information. And so that's really one of the big reasons why 
I wanted to have this webinar and talk about this and how the best way to leverage it, I'm going to go back to the granularity. And this is one example is promotion. So this type of granularity and insight is not available through a traditional syndicated panel. You just can't get enough sample on a week-by-week -week basis. So on the left, and the, the details are not important at all, but just kind of, this is a typical delivery, so I get dollar sales, what percent of sales are on promo, and then the raw components, how many buyers, how many transactions, how many units. And from those four raw measures in particular, I can calculate all these other measures. And so the first thing I want to do when I decompose promotion is decompose it into buyers and then dollars per buyer. So buyers is, did I get more people buying the product because it was on deal? Dollars per buyer is, did I, you know, do, uh, you know, load up the consumer? One of the most popular types of promotions we see out there now is this buy one, get 50 off. So it's kind of a, what I've, view as retailers way of trying to fool consumers and make believe make them uh, think they're getting a BOGO when they're actually getting the equivalent of 25% off. This tells you definitively, is that successful? Are they in fact buying multiple? So let's look at that graphically. I'm going to look at two top, the two top brands in this HBC category. We're looking at dollars in units right here. And so you can see very clearly the spikes is when promotional uh, activity occurred and then there's a little spike here that I'll talk about notice this percent of dollars on deal it's a close to a hundred percent it's well over 80 for the vast majority of weeks we're seeing that more and more with um, retailers with shopper data that that measure is becoming virtually useless whether you're deriving it from your syndicated scan data or your shopper data and the reason being is because uh, all the digital couponing that can pretty much be executed at no cost is essentially going all the time. And so you're saying, you know, whether it has effect or not, I mean, all you're doing is reading that there's just a huge quantity of sales going out on deal when that actually isn't a, an accurate read. In fact, right here, this correlates unit sales versus percent of sales on deal. So you see this huge cluster here. The R squared, meaning what percent of the variation in units is explained by the deal activity? Very low, 21%. But what does explain it then is if we go back to that decomposition. So I'm looking again at the number of buyers on a week-by-week -week basis, and this is only something you can get through the shopper data. And I could even take this down to a lower level, probably SKU level, and still get a violent, you know, valid sample. Then you can do all kinds of great things like switching and cross-purchasing and all the answer all those questions that everybody has on, you know, did I take from a larger size, another brand, future weeks, all that stuff. But here this is just brand aggregation. And what you see is that these two spikes in buyer count correlate very highly. In fact, almost 100% with the increases in sales. Um, when I had a, a reduced price, my dollars per buyer actually went down. I got more buyers, but the, uh, the two offset, and I didn't get a very big increase. So this is one example where we see that the, the buyer count, improving buyer count is really the better way to generate incremental sales. And in fact, if we correlate that in, in any given week, whether it's promotion or not promotion, you can see extremely high R squared, very high statistical uh, relationship between the two measures, almost none on the dollars per buyer with total dollars. I mean, it's just all kind of clustered around a very narrow area, almost just random noise in this example. So let's look at another big example. And so here we have that same uh, movement. We're just going to focus on this one spike right here. Again, dollars on deal, useless measure. So here's two instances where we, you know, did, and I believe it was a buy one, get 50. And so you do see some increase in the dollars per buyer, uh, a very slight increase in units, but the overall impact on a dollar basis was not all that much, a dollar and a unit basis, whereas in this instance where I got the units, the buyer count up, I'm sorry, that's when the units really spike. So again, another instance, and you know, if you continue to want to doubt it, we could spend another 10 hours 
talking about this, and I'll show you another, you know, 500 examples. It's really a very consistent notion um, that, and again, here you see the correlation that it's really buyer count. When you're looking at a shopper uh, data within a retailer, it's movement and buyer count that does a better job of explaining movement in your business than dollars per buyer or purchase quantity. Now, here's a very high relationship. So that's actually, I mean, something at the way outer bound. So it's not to say you throw it out entirely because there's going to be cases where this is an important metric to understand, but even still an 88% um, explan explanation is more than 57. And so this isn't a, a, actually new. I'm, this is not groundbreaking material. There's a, this author, and you might want to go back. It's called How Brands Grow by Byron Sharp, an Australian uh, professor that does a lot of panel-based work. And that was basically his uh, conclusion that it, it all has to do with penetration as far as why brands increase. You get more buyers. Now, for the most part, our work, the analysis we've done, corroborates that, but there are notable instances, and here's one of them where you still need to pay attention to dollars per buyer, but it's really buyer count that matters. Um, so let's jump now to buyer profile uh, demographic summaries. And so here's typically the way people like to look at it. I look on an index, so my dollars per buyer is 75% higher among 36 to 45 and 46% higher among 26 to 35. So very high skewing groups and, you know, I'm real happy. I've, you know, appealed to the, you know, these, which it tends to be, it looks to be families. But there's a problem with this approach. And here's the problem is that it doesn't look at the actual volume contribution that is being delivered. So here are the customer counts, what percent of customers, we can also and should also do it on dollars and transactions, but you can see these two high indexing groups are three right here. I mean, we're only talking within our own business, 40%, or around 40% of our, our customer base. And even if we, so here we're benchmarking against a competitive set, not the entire category. So we get all excited and divert all of our uh, efforts against these high indexing groups, but we forget that still the majority, a clear majority of our customers are over 45. And so that's what we call the tyr oops, sorry, the tyranny of indices. And so a couple things on this as well. If the indices are between 80 and 125, they're usually not worth getting excited about. So we're really only looking for the extreme differences that matter. So I see a lot of people write up, oh, you know, we have an, uh, a young children indexing a 110. That's your target market. It's like, no, it's not. I mean, that is, you know, only marginally better than the, you know, not even one percentage point higher. So it really, in fact, in all these, um, variables, these demographic variables, the only one that really matters is age. And even then, you don't want to get, as I mentioned, you don't want to get distorted by just looking at the indices. Look at the sales contribution as well. Now, the beauty, again, I'll get back to the whole granularity, is I could run this for every single SKU in my line. And so I can then say, you know, with precision, how do my uh, individual items, how are they appealing to different customers? And I mean, that could be really, really powerful as far as, uh, you know, your whole marketing. I mean, if you then wanted to line that up with Spectra and how you arrange, you know, what the most visible items are or what your assortment strategy is going to be um, or just your whole new product. Uh, so, hey, maybe I have a couple items that have this distinct demographic profile. And, oh, by the way, they're my two best selling items. So uh, what is that demographic that I'm appealing to and how can I do more of that? Um, so it's just you leverage that ability to get granular with your data. I can't stress that enough on loyalty data. So that's one way to look at segmentation. We also, there's a general shopper value segmentation and you have all these exotic clustering and segment methods and, and it provides, hold on, wait for it. It is 
you basically get a heavy to light buyer continuum. And it's really a lousy one, usually a lousy one at that. Meaning they're bringing in all these other variables uh, and considerations to create their segmentations. And I use this general they. I mean, there's actually a couple retailers that seem to do it much better than others. But here's a great point. So ooh, I have my VIPs and my enthusiasts and my occasional spenders and my least engaged. Oh, does that mean heaviest to lightest buyers? And why did I need to carve it into six different groups? So here I have four groups that are pretty much mathematically indistinct. So there is some meaning between the high, the VIPs, and the least engaged. Uh, but even that difference, it's only, you know, 30% of the sales contribution. So this is a brand where I kind of, am, uh, and that's where I say I'm at the mercy of their segmentation. Here's another where where we, we don't have diamond diamond customers. So it's 30% of my uh, customers are diamond, and that's more than the retailer that's 26. And so consequently, what we see is, you know, this kind of secret sauce segmentation, and then the retailers always try to get the manufacturers to invest in supporting their diamond customers or whatever we want to call these people. And this is so mind-numbingly consistent, we see. So they do a great job because they're investing such a disproportionate amount in these customers. And then they neglect all the other customers and lose share overall. Because this is still the majority of our customers. It's still you know, 40% or some, you know, significant amount. And because they're not getting the focus that these top tier customers are getting, it weighs the business down overall. And I see it, uh, you know, I've probably seen it a half dozen times just over the last year as I've done this analysis. So it's important, and that's where we get back to the when I talked about the demographics. And every segment has value. It's just relative value. Just we don't isolate only on where we see a high index customer. If you have the ability, and there's a couple retailer shopper card programs where you do, then I would strongly encourage you to create your own segments using transaction level data, or basically you can rank all your buyers based on high to low number of transactions per year. And you get four basic groups, and this is consistent with any category we've looked at, light, medium, heavy, and extreme. And the contributions of each of these groups is very consistent. Now, this is a particular brand. If I looked at it on a category basis, we just consistently see about 4 to 5% of the buyers account for 20% of the sales, and we call those extreme. If you looked at their purchasing, even on a health and beauty care product, they're buying these things a category like once every other week. So can you imagine buying, say, a, a shampoo or a cosmetic or a foot care product? I mean, they're really hardcore maniacs that do nothing but buy crap. So... It's a really interesting insight because, the, the, I mean, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, just the fact that there are so many of these people, of course, not the majority, but a meaningful number that are delivering. So here's 7% of the people delivering more than this light group to, uh, that is 34% of the buyer base. And here you can see the indices are create meaningful differentiation. And so you can have a meaningful strategy toward each. Again, you don't ignore these guys. They're a third of your business. It's just there's a need to be, then you kind of look at, well, what kind of offers appeal to them? Or is it an offer? Or is it a selection? What's the assortment? What are the top items here versus up here? All kinds of ways you can then analyze those segments as far as the four Ps, distribution, pricing, promotion, placement. So... But that only occurs if you create these segmentations to really pull out the true differences in consumer purchasing patterns. So here's a next step. We'll go to purchase dynamics. And here's a very typical output, just lots and lots of numbers. Oh, that's not enough. I'm going to do more, more numbers. And like, what am I even looking at here? And it's just a mess. 
So always understand, get back to the basic, and I have no doubt that there's value to most, if not all, of these numbers, but we need to put them in a coherent, cohesive manner. So here's just one way. I mean, we always want to go back and remember that first promo decomp where we, in our basic components, so dollars to break into buyers and dollars per buyer. Dollars per buyer break into number of transactions transactions per buyer and dollars per transaction. So we kind of go down the chain. First thing we see is here's another example where dollars correlating highly on a brand basis with the number of buyers. Here's one that stands out. I'm going to kind of isolate on this, this pink brand right here. So you can see it's relatively low on buyers, but it actually does much better than all, but it would be the number six brand if ranked on dollars. So Let's take a look at a little bit and get some more understanding on that. So here, let's decompose now that dollars per buyer into number of trips per buyer, dollars per trip. And this here is a very important chart to embrace. So if I did this on any given category, I would see pretty much the same thing. And what I'm looking at it is very, very little difference in the number of purchases per buyer. This is a health and beauty care brand, and notice that only a couple or even more than one and a half purchases per year, and the sample size is very strong. Um, even a food brand at a food retailer, you're lucky if you get over three. So the vast majority of consumers within a retailer are only buying it once a year. And now just think about that. So given that you only have one chance at getting them, what are the strategies you want to employ to make sure that they're converted? Here's where the differentiation is on a branded basis, and it really seems dollars per trip or transaction size really seems like pink is just a premium item uh, that does a pretty good job also. I mean, you know, get a normal number of repeat purchases. And that I referred to Sharp uh, a little bit earlier. He, I've seen this, you know, a dozen times, maybe more. He's done the same analysis hundreds, if not thousands, and seen very similar pattern. You get almost no differentiation in their trips per buyer when you compare various brands. Uh, and that's why he's gone so hardcore, and it's all about buyer count. I mean, the fact that there is some level of differences means there's some level of uh, analytical attention needs to be paid to it, but certainly... You know, it somewhat undermines or belies the whole notion of loyalty. And it's really then, that's why I say it's more shopper rewards data. And then here's another area where people get hung up in trips and baskets. And here's the value of the store, uh, the shopper. This is annual value, pink, uh, much more valuable than all the other um, brands. But overall, again, it's unusual to see... Um, that much differentiation. Normally, um, you can see here's the other 14 or so brands that are very close together. A couple dip pretty strongly, but this is kind of an exception. And when you are an exception, it certainly is the pink brand. You want to uh, call it out. But uh, in general, look at this market basket. And why it's so similar is because what I've already showed you, consumers purchase lots of different products. They very rarely are they ultra loyal, and so consequently what you're getting is a lot of overlap in these buyer groups. So you're essentially me measuring the same buyers, and that's why you don't pull out a whole lot of differentiation on some of these measures, particularly at a store level. Then finally getting trial and repeat. And so what we do, and this really, I see a lot of people doing trial and repeat for category uh, for products that are already in, in distribution, which is not what you should be using trial and repeat for, because the interesting part of trial and repeat is the slope of this curve. It's not the fact that where you end up at the end so much is what is the rate of increase that you're achieving, and when do you see that start to decelerate? And then how does that compare to some of your benchmark items? I mean, you can build up a really powerful database of knowledge and get a very, consequently, get a, a very quick read on is this thing going to succeed or fail? Because remember, at a retailer level, 
buyer count is everything, and that really means am I getting people? The trial is basically how many people are buying you. The, the dotted line is what's the cumulative repeat, so at any given time, and you can see in this product, it only got to 16%. You say, ah, oh, that's terrible. Isn't the success norm at least 40 percent? And the answer is yes, on an all outlet basis. But within a retailer, even for a food product, it's going to be well under that. You know, if you hit 25 or 30 percent, you're doing a great job uh, getting repeat on a you know a branded basis or a sub brand or whatever. But when you can start benchmarking this against other new products, then you have a really powerful database that can, you can use internally as well. Um, and, and you can build this up across all the various retailers so that you can maybe then make the case, well, you know, we had this great trial uh, rate of uh, adoption at this one, you know, three retailers, but retailer four, we didn't. How, what was different about those? And how do we uh, change things going in the future? But it really has to do with understanding the trial much more than the repeat. You don't want to totally neglect the repeat, but you know the primary focus is on the trial. And then here's you know where I talked about benchmarking. So let's then it summarize the key things on loyalty card data. And I keep saying loyalty. I'm going to switch to shopper data. Is that it cannot and should not be your only source of consumer level data. Household panel or survey needs to be part of the mix. Now you're not going to get either of those with the same types of frequency. You can't because of the whole sample issue. But you definitely want to have a view of the entire universe, not just what's going on with the retailer, because most of the purchases of those consumers are going on outside of that particular retailer. Buyer count is by far, far the most important measure in understanding trends, and I don't want to belabor that point. I've talked about it enough. But the really the maximum value of the, getting the most out of your loyalty data, your shopper data, is when you exploit the granularity as far as looking at item level, exploiting the number of items, the consistency of access, the, uh, the, the weekly data, and even actually daily. So, you, I mean, it, it's just you really, and I, I'm sure I have only thought about you know, a fraction of the uh, applications you can employ when you have access to such high quality granular data. Always remember to benchmark. So if I had shown you that trial and repeat and showed only 16% repeat, you would have said, oh my God, it's a disaster. But then if we pull other brands and what we saw is that the majority of those triers don't even repeat to the category, much less the brand. And so the 16% wasn't actually all that bad. <clears throat> and there's a whole lot of, besides trial and pre, a whole lot of other great new product analysis. So getting the demographics of those new SKUs versus other items in the line, if you do a line extension, shows did I carve out a distinct niche or is maybe the one of the reasons why it was so uh, you know lackluster of an intro was because it was just the exact same consumers I'd been appealing to before. Um, and you can also identify, well, where's all that volume coming from? Is it totally new to the category? Is it coming from other brands? So there's a lot of all of that type of uh, granular insight you can get. And then finally, this extreme buyer group. If you have the ability to pull that out of your shopper data and get transaction level or create these buyers, I would strongly encourage you to do it. You'll get a whole new vein of insights from both your uh, your Nielsen panel data as well as your shopper data at a retailer level. Those 5% of buyers or 7% at a brand level are doing 20% of the sales. And so they do so much in explaining why niche brands actually are incremental because these hardcore buyers just like to buy all kinds of different stuff. Choice is very important to them. Promotions are very important to them. So it also explains the incrementality of promotions. If you do it with your panel data, you can understand where they shift to and how they 
allocate their purchases by retailer. So a lot of times the retailers are looking at, oh, there are, quote, loyal customers because they're in the top, let's say, 20% of the purchases. But if you measure them on a true loyalty, they're not getting a higher percentage of those buyers than any other buyers. It's just they are the shopaholics that buy everywhere. So that's how I would summarize trying to derive value out of your uh, shopper data, you need to take a little bit different tack than you do, actually a substantially different tack than you would, you know, and that you may be used to with just your syndicated panel. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dustin and answer any questions you have.